Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and welcome to class number seven in our uh, Understanding Contemporary Art. Last time we were talking about uh, Mark Rothko, the first half of his oeuvre. This time I want to talk about the rest of it. And we had seen that uh, what Rothko had done was to essentially create a cosmos made out of self-luminous light forms, these pulsing, radiant, elementary units of being. And what I want to do now is pick up his work with 1957 here uh, with this painting, Black on Red of 1957, where for the first time now, an interesting new element begins to enter his work, an element of blackening. Black begins to come into his paintings during this period, and it begins to proliferate. There are a lot of blacks and uh, maroons, black on red, red on maroon, a whole bunch of them from 1957. And this element of blackening, and there are a lot of earth tone colors, dark browns and so forth, that begin to come in at this time, essentially represents the element of materiality. These are earth tones, in other words that had been missing from his self-luminous cosmos of pure light forms. So now he begins to come up with a kind of anti-cosmos that's an anti-universe that is in direct opposition to his previous universe. And this, this becomes more clear, I think, when we look at uh, the murals that he did for Philip Johnson's Four Seasons uh, restaurant in New York in 1959. This is red on maroon. And what we see here is a totally different kind of cosmology. It's very much opposed to the previous cosmology that he'd come up with, beginning with the, the multiforms from 46 all the way down through 1954. Here we see uh, that the black, the blackening element, which essentially portends uh, what Heidegger would term the nothing, the nothing is opposed to being. Being uh, is represented in Rothko by the pulsing light units, but the nothing now begins to assert itself and to enter in an invasive way into his cosmos, and it begins to form the borders for all of these uh, compositions, these murals that he did, which proved to be abortive murals. He decided to pull out at the last minute. He didn't want his work degraded to the level of Muzak. Uh, but here we see that there's a central, what he's painting here is a central semiotic vacancy that is at the heart of the center of Western being in the post-metaphysical age. Now, during the metaphysical age, um, this kind of central uh, center of a composition would have been occupied, as in this case, the painting here of Petrus Christus's Madonna on a dried tree of 1465, where we can see that she is framed by a tree that also doubles as uh, a metaphor for Christ's crown of thorns, uh, but that there isn't a semiotic vacancy here at the center. The, at the, the center is occupied by what's known in philosophy as a, as a transcendental signified, that is to say an ultimate term of reference of the Madonna here. In other words, an iconotype. Um, and the paintings of the metaphysical age would be the central compositions, the central parts of them would be not semiotic vacancies at all, because all forms of meaning were referred to these ultimate signifieds, the iconotypes of the crucifixion, the Last Supper, the Madonna, and so forth. Um, and so when we go back to these, um, the central semiotic vacancies of the works then that Rothko is doing here for these Seagram murals, here we have uh, black on maroon uh, from the same period where we have two semiotic vacancies that are at the center here. And then in red on maroon from this same group, we see another semiotic vacancy surrounded by red. Um, this is the semiotic vacancy that is at the heart of the West's understanding of being now in the post-metaphysical age when all the transcendental signifieds have been pulled apart, deconstructed, um, anathematized, and gotten rid of. Now there is only an empty center. This is what Derrida called in his essay uh, on uh, in one of his famous essays in writing a difference, um, the empty center at the heart of the West's understanding of being. It's now empty. Um, there's a quest now that's beginning an art for new signifieds to fill that center. And um, that the, the, the intrusive element of the blackening does begin to become a threat to Rothko. We can see in the murals that he did for the, the Harvard Chapel, the Harvard murals, murals of 1962, in the fact that he begins to create a, a sort of chains or a polymerization of these black Stonehenge-like uh, monolithic structures, he begins to connect them together into chains and create polymers. And of course, polymers are created in evolution, like the bilayers that are created by cells at the start of evolution, uh, when there's an attempt to recognize self versus other. And, and so um, Pollock's, or rather, uh, Rothko's defense mechanisms are up here now. He's beginning to sense the threat that the nothing poses to his cosmos of being. And indeed, uh, the nothing uh, was described by Heidegger as that which is opposed to being and is a threat to being because the nothing 
introduces an oscillation into the heart of being and threatens to destabilize it. After all, everything that is will one day not be. And so the nothing is the counter concept of being and it enters into Rothko's work and it slowly over time begins to destabilize his entire cosmos and bring all the signifiers in it, uh, including the semiotic vacancies which are absent of signifiers down the drain. Uh, and this becomes especially clear in the Rothko Chapel that he did between 1964 and 1967 here. We see the Rothko Chapel has this kind of Zen-like simplicity about it. But now note that the nothing, the black, has completely permeated all of his canvases and totally taken them over to the point that the nothing has won. In the battle of the struggle that is evident in Rothko's work between being and nothing, uh, the nothing has won, as we see here in these completely black canvases that are shorn of all signifiers and all semiotics whatsoever. They're total semiotic vacancies. Whereas the semiotic vacancies that he had been painting for the Seagram murals were essentially the semiotic vacancies at the heart of the West where the iconotypes had been dismantled and deconstructed and were pictured as no longer being there. Um, here, the semiotic vacancies that he paints, um, that he paints in these um, in the Rothko Chapel for the Demenals, is essentially the semiotic vacancy of the absence of his own cosmology. His entire cosmology has gone down the drain here, and he's representing the semiotic vacancy of that rather than just the West's central heart of absent being, the absent center at the, at the heart of the West understanding of being. And here is a central triptych uh, from that chapel uh, from '64 and '67. Uh, and the complete victory of the nothing over being. Uh, but now, uh, in the late 60s, uh, Rothko had an aneurysm that nearly killed him, but he recovered, and he the struggle of uh, the nothing, or the struggle of being against the nothing, begins to reassert itself in his final series of canvases, which are acrylics, blacks on grays, and here is one of them. This is his black on gray from 1969 to 70 in which being once more now begins to reassert itself against the nothing, and we see the white representative being beginning to push back against the nothing and to push against it and there for one moment there they're in perfect equilibrium we see the being and the nothing in a state of total perfect equilibrium uh, and this series was painted just before Rothko committed suicide in 1970 by slicing into his arms with with uh, razor blades at the kitchen sink um, so this was his final statement uh, he refused to completely allow the nothing to totally engulf and swallow his cosmos and it's interesting how it ends with the sort of Monarchian struggle of the powers of light against the powers of darkness.